Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 110. Dream as if you would live forever and live as if you will die tomorrow. Anonymous. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my Indie Film Hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Videoblocks. Now, Videoblocks is a subscription-based stock media company that gives you unlimited access to premium stock footage everyone could afford. If you're looking for like extra exterior shots or things that you might want to incorporate into any of your projects, whether that be a narrative, documentary, music videos, commercials, these guys got you covered. They've got unlimited daily downloads from a library of over 115,000 HD video clips, as well as a huge selection of After Effects templates for like opening credits, uh, motion graphics titles, company logos, as well as motion backgrounds as well. It's pretty amazing. And at, on average, uh, subscribers pay less than a dollar per download in a course of a year. And the content does not get stale. They're constantly adding new content to the library every month. So it keeps it keeps it very, very fresh and you always have something new to look forward to. And everything you download is 100% royalty free. Even if your subscription is canceled, you have unrestricted usage rights for anything you want to do, including personal projects and commercial projects. And you keep whatever you download and maintain the usage rights forever. Now, Video Blocks is offering the tribe a yearly subscription for 99 bucks. That's 50 bucks off the usual price tag just for you guys, just for the tribe. That's less than 10 bucks a month. So to get this deal, just head over to videoblocks.com slash hustle. That's videoblocks, V-I-D-E-O blocks.com forward slash hustle for this exclusive offer. And don't forget to go to freefilmbook.com. That's freefilmbook.com to download your free filmmaking audiobooks from Audible. So guys, today on the show, we have director Benjamin Cox. He just directed an amazing little film called Better Off Single that's going to be released uh, soon if it has not already been released and has a great cast including legends, comedy legends, Louis Black and Chris Elliott. And he is uh, one of the definitions of indie film hustling without question. He did a lot of film, indie film hustling to make this movie and to get this movie made. And uh, he wanted to share the sh- his uh, story with the tribe. And I hope you guys pick up something out of this because he drops a lot of little knowledge bombs, a lot of little nuggets of great information on how he got this thing made, how he worked with actors, how he got it financed, how he got it finished, and so on. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Benjamin Cox. Would I like to welcome to the show, guys, Benjamin Cox. How are you doing, sir? Hey, I'm well. How are you? Good, Thanks man. For having me. Oh, thank you for doing it, man. You have a a fun little movie, uh, and and I think it you definitely did a lot of indie film hustling uh, during <laughs> during uh, the making. I, I heard, so I thought it would be a great uh, a great so a great story to kind of talk about and see how you got uh, not just like a little low budget thing off the ground, but uh, it looks like at least it looks like a substantial film, sir. Production cool. wise, uh, production value wise, right on. Nothing like uh, the indie film, just uh, yeah. from soup to nuts. So. Yeah, absolutely, so. absolutely. So, um, how did you get into the crazy business, man? First of all, <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because um, you know, unlike I, I guess, I guess, kind of a lot like a, a number of filmmakers, I did my first film, you know, probably when I was like in third grade, one of those kinds of things, mm-hmm. and then um, kind of took a bit of a detour um, and did sort of non film related things for a while. Um, and then uh, probably around 2000, I don't know, three, 2004, something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got involved in New York with, uh, an organization called Stellar Network, which was founded, um, by a number of folks, um, including Hannah Mangella, um, who is now running uh, production over at TriStar and, uh, she's, she's kind of amazing. And Nicola Berman and some other folks all, with the goal of helping young up-and-comers in film, theater, and television enhance their careers via networking. And so uh, I was working actually in finance at the time, and I uh, volunteered to be their their finance director on this organization. So it gave me the opportunity to get involved with 
uh, folks who are just doing this full time and uh, talking to them about their projects and then networking and then learning and figuring out sort of the be best sort of plan of attack for when I was going to fully transition um, out of the day job, if you will, into uh, the filmmaking side of things. And then, you know, of course, meeting people, networking, the, the, the purpose of that organization, which was so fantastic. So. Um, that, that's really kind of how it started on some level. Now, you said uh, the, the one word that stuck out for me was TriStar because I haven't seen that horse logo in such a long time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't even know if TriStar, uh, the logo still exists. I'm not really sure. <laughs> I know. You're right because you know what I'm talking about. Like, you know, we, you, I used to see that wonderful horse animation with the – with the uh, flying, the flying, it was such a great thing. Anyway, I'm just geeking out. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know the one. That's pretty great. So how? Um, so I saw that you you've made a lot of short films in your career so far. How did making those short films prepare you for your feature debut? Um, well, you know, I, I really think you, you just kind of have to roll up your sleeves and get in there and just start shooting stuff because you you can look at things in an abstract level and say, oh well. I mean, first of all, you know you know that you're a director when you watch something on TV and you immediately think to yourself, like, man, I could do that better, right? I mean, that's just <laughs> sort of like a, uh, I don't know. Touche, yes, sir, yes. <laughs> kind of what goes through every director's brain. I mean, it's an arrogance or whatever. I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. But then what you find is when you start shooting it, you're like, oh, maybe I can't do that better because I don't actually know what I'm doing. <laughs> exactly. So from, from that perspective, it was hugely informative for me to get – uh, you know, get behind the camera, uh, start writing, um, crewing up, you know, doing all the things that it takes to, you know, make a movie and, and really try things out. I mean, in the first handful of uh, projects that I worked on, short films, you know, uh, I, I, I was lucky in the sense that I was working with some folks who uh, really knew what they were talking about and uh, really gave me an appreciation for sort of the editing process and what it means uh, to cut something and make it better and better and better and better and how. Um, you know, I, I assume on uh, on this podcast we can swear, right? So yes, sir. I, what I like to call it is the is the fuck it button. Um, so uh, yeah. words, <laughs> if you're, and this is particularly relevant for me whenever I'm writing or if I am editing something. What I mean by the fuck it button is you get to a certain point where you start to question your life, like you're writing a scene or you're you're you can't figure out how to get the transition and the edit from like one sequence to another sequence or why isn't this performance working? And you 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 like you're pounding your head against the wall. You start to wonder why you're not a bartender in Maui or doing something literally questioning your <laughs> that, life. That I sounds so good. <laughs> and you literally get to the point where you know sort of the proverbial red button appears that says fuck it because you can at that point just do what most people do which is to say all right you know what performance is good enough fuck it you know what i've been cutting this thing for weeks fuck it you know and moving mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. sort of the sick side of me is when that button appears if you will uh that's that's for me the the point at which you can do something truly great so you have to push through it you got to move the button aside and really dig in further and I think learning those lessons on short films is hugely important because then when you really get down to brass tacks later, it's like you get it. You're like, okay, now I understand going in these eight lines of dialogue or descriptive or whatever from the script before we even get to the set because it's going to be pointless. I'm going to kill it in the edit anyway. Um, and I think I think really sticking to it and digging deep, if you will, is the thing that's going to – uh, going to make things work and allow you to be as efficient as you need to be when you get to something like, you know, shooting a movie like Better Off Single, where, you know, we had we shot that in um, in 18 days, uh, three six day weeks with like two days off in between, and so it was fast. And there's like 51 story days in that movie, uh, running around New York City. So the only way we could do that for you know a pretty a pretty modest budget. Uh, is uh, is by being as efficient as possible and and really uh, making sure we know what we're doing. Now, um, as as uh, I think it was as it was Picasso or Da Vinci. I'm not sure who it was, but it says that uh, art is never finished; it's abandoned. So that <laughs> that that would be the fuck it button. Fuck it button. <laughs> At a certain point, you just got to go. I I could be on this scene literally for another year. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, but it, what's interesting too is like Scorsese has an interesting uh, approach to this kind of thing. Like they, somebody asked him at some point, um, you know, hey, why don't you go back to Mean Streets and, you know, recut it the way like George Lucas does some of his stuff. And <laughs> and he's like, you know, uh, for in order for him to feel like 
it, it's truly representative of where he is at, at a certain stage in his career as a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. He has to give it everything he's got at the time, make literally the best movie that he can possibly make. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Mm-hmm. At that stage. And then... And then when he's done, he knows he did everything he could possibly do, and then he moves on, and he's never going to change it again. And, and sure, if he made Mean Streets today, would it be better? Well, in theory, yeah, it should be because he's he's evolved, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, but it's representative of where he was at that time, and so you know that's really all you can do. And so for me, it's it's less about the notion of abandonment; it's more like this is representative of what my skill sets are, and uh, and I try not to get too precious about. Oh my God, it's the be all and end all because if I don't, you know, <laughs> do this, I'm going to have anxiety forever. Right. It's kind of like you do the best that you can possibly do and, um, and then, and then you go on to the next thing and that's cool because it's all part of one body of work. Right. So then you look at, I'm sure you look back as I do with my short films and you just go, Oh, I could do that better. I could do that better. Jeez, I, why, why didn't I do that? Why did I do this? And, and, but that's any artist, I think with any, yeah. any form of art, you know, I'm sure you go back and just go, Oh. I could change that. I could change this. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. Now, how did you get Better Off Single off the ground? Uh, well, you know, it, it's interesting because um, for me, uh, there was a lot of – and I imagine this is similar for folks who are directing their first feature. It, it was it was a question of like, well, who, who the fuck is Ben Cox, right? Like, <laughs> you know, who is this guy? Uh, it doesn't – you know what I mean? It's nice that, that I can – speak words and maybe maybe you like the script or maybe you don't like the script Mm -hmm. um but but when unless you have at least some sort of recognition over the notion like hey this is this is something you know how to do and you have a track record for it it's like you're you're kind of up shit's creek and so uh for me it was about building a team uh and uh one of the first things i did was um try to really dig deep on the script um and i really believe in feedback and uh, trying to get as much of that feedback as I could possibly get and starting with like sort of what I would call low-hanging fruit, i.e. people who don't necessarily work in the industry or people who work in the industry but are friendly and are not going to badmouth you to somebody else later because they read something that was drivel and they were like, <laughs> you tell about it. Uh, and, and like really bounce ideas off of people and just see, well, what's working on the page and, you know, what changes need to be made. And so, you know, I think I probably took like a good year of just going back and getting as much feedback as humanly possible on the script um, and letting people tear it apart and and specifically trying to solicit that feedback in as detailed a way as possible Mm -hmm. so that I could sit down usually in in sort of units of 10 where I'd have – I'd have 10 versions of the script where people have marked it up and mm-hmm. then I would sit down and look at page one and go, okay, well, there's three jokes on this page because it's, you know, it's a comedy, right? So there's three jokes on this page. Two of them are resonating all the time and one of them, eh, not so much. So it's mm-hmm. like gives me at least a sense of what I need to be killing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then after getting the script to a point where it's like, okay, now that the low-hanging fruit has been – uh, exhausted now now take a little bit more risk and bring it out to some people and one of the one of the people that I met in my time with stellar network that I had mentioned before is a woman named Tracy Becker who um, you know her brainchild uh, was finding Neverland sort of back in the day she's the one who mm-hmm. um, developed that and brought it to at the time Miramax and then they obviously made it into a movie and that was like her first feature mm-hmm. as a producer and obviously not a bad one to have it not a ba- not a bad one to start with yeah yeah, and so she and I were friendly uh, via the Stellar Network stuff, and I, I brought it to her and you know asked her for notes, and she gave me a ton of notes, and I said, would this be something you'd be interested in working on as a producer? And she said, no. <laughs> okay. But absolutely not. Uh, it's not far enough along. You know, here is like a copious amount of notes that I would incorporate, and you know, and you should be getting notes from other people. And I got a whole bunch from other people, blah blah blah. Um, and then you know, I went away for a few months, and I came back, and I said, all right, here's here's where we are now. Can you let me know if this might be uh, be feasible? And uh, she said, yeah, this is cool. Now let's talk. So so now Tracy is somebody who um, is real in the industry. Mm-hmm. Like, no, she's doing. And so she's um, signed on to produce with me. Nice. Uh, and um, and I one of the short films that I had produced uh, years before was something where the DP was uh, a guy named Vincent Laferre, who's pretty prolific in sort of like the 
the the digital um, filmmaking space. He actually won a Pulitzer as a photographer. He's kind of awesome. Um, and Vincent uh, read the script and he was like, hey, I'm really into this script uh, and I love it. Um, he goes, but what I would do is I would um, additionally talk to uh, Russell Carpenter. And I was like, who's Ru- Russell Carpenter? <laughs> Russell Carpenter won, yes. won an Oscar for uh, cinematography for Titanic, right? right. He's so, James Cameron's guy, did you lies at a bunch of his movies? Yeah, yeah he did. He, I mean, I, I know who he is now, but he, uh, but at the time I really didn't have an appreciation and I looked him up and I was like, wow, okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, if, if he's willing to read the script, I'd love to, to do did, it. Did Russell, did Russell, did, did, was your, was he your DP on this? Uh, he, he, he initially signed on to be the DP of uh-huh. the movie, um, which is sort of one of the best, um, meetings I ever had. Probably my favorite coffee of all time. Oh my God. I can imagine. You know, out in L.A. where we sat there for like, I mean, three plus hours. And I don't think I touched the latte that was in front of me. We were both <laughs> very animated and talking about all things creative. And uh, and he was a big fan of the script, which is cool. And it felt very complimentary. And um, and so he said, look, you know, I, who knows what, what will end up happening. There's all kinds of things. He goes, but if it's helpful, um, yeah, I would love to do it. I think it'd be great. You know, you can figure out what it is. Now, it ended up being the case that we couldn't raise enough funds to do this as a union movie. Um, mm-hmm. So Russell was an executive producer on the movie, and he helped us get gear and do some other things. Like, got a great call from Panavision one day, like, Russell would like us to help you. We are going to help you. Um, <laughs> oh, you know, nice. Awesome. Uh, but anyway, so it's like, you know, I got Tracy involved. I got Russell involved. Um, and then I had been working on sort of different people from, like, a casting perspective for a long time. And um uh, one of the people I came in contact with is Patricia DeSerto, who casts, uh, among other things, all of Woody Allen's movies. She's done like his last, I don't know, twenty plus movies, mm-hmm. and and so she is phenomenal. And I probably begged her for I don't know two years mm-hmm. <laughs> to be the casting director for the movie. And um, and at, at one point she finally said, you know what? All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, and so. With those folks, and then you know Chris Doritas, who's a DJ at KCRW um, in LA, um, he he came up with the show Morning Becomes Eclectic forever ago, and um, he's kind of a legend uh, as a music supervisor too. He's been nominated for a couple of Grammys, mm-hmm. so he joined to be our music supervisor slash co-producer on the movie, and he brought along with him a guy named Chris Muckley, who's also a DJ at KCRW and is amazing, and is, is the mm-hmm. music supervisor on the movie ultimately, and um, just started building out as as impressive a team as i could possibly muster who it's a hell of a team all people yeah it's pretty great i mean like my goal is to be sort of like the you know dumbest slowest least attractive person involved in the movie <laughs> that's, like a smart, I, that's really smart advice actually yeah i mean you know like my, my thinking is like if i'm the worst one then we're we're gonna be fine right you know so so you know if you get people in with the right attitude and who are really really great then you're building a positive spiral uh, for success, and it's like a bucket of water, right? I mean, I sound cheesy when I say shit like this, but you know, here I go. It's like it's a bucket of water, right? If you spin in one direction, or if you spin in the other direction, whichever way you're going to start spinning that water, it's going to move, right? Mm-hmm. So you go negative, it's going negative, and even if you try to like stop it and go the other way, you have to first fight the current to stop it, and then get it going in the right direction. But if That's you get that positive idea. spiral going. You know, the same thing applies where it's going to help you and it will carry you in spots once it's already moving so that as long as people uh, understand and believe that like, you know, that this thing is moving forward um, and and we're out to make something that's truly fucking great, then I think you can uh, really make something that's really fucking great. And that's kind of the idea. That's really a great – I'm going to steal that analogy because that's an actually great analogy for – for that because a lot of times filmmakers just get caught up in the negative or there's the wrong kind of people, the wrong kind of team and it just kind of starts going the one direction and then it just goes right into the ground. But I've seen other projects that they just pick the right people at the right time and then things just start moving. And it's yeah. true and it take and even if something negative happens, your momentum is still going positively so it can handle it and you just kind of keep going. Um and now th- I was going to ask you the question like how did you get over the whole first time director thing? Uh, but I see what you've done is you actually got a whole bunch of 800 pound gorillas in a room and they kind of, yeah. they kind of helped you bust through the door a bit. And obviously the script and the, and the project itself. But I know a lot of people with good scripts that never get them made. So you were smart enough to kind of bring in the right people that could get, at least attract the right people to help you get through the door. Am I, am, is that a great, uh, is that a good explanation? 
Yeah, yeah, I think I think so. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 uh, you know, I also try to think about it as like um, you know, like the who's driving the bus factor, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And and if and if you and if you let people know that like look we're driving the bus and uh, and on some level it's kind of like a game of chicken right <laughs> analogy that that uh, some somebody gave me a long time ago which I think is, is apropos is if you're you're driving in your car and you're going straight towards this bus and you are playing chicken the only way that you can win <laughs> truly is to look the other driver in the eye as you're pummeling towards one another and take the steering wheel off your car. (laughs) And so as long as the other driver sees you threw the steering wheel out the window, then you don't have a choice. You know, I mean, it's not like this is, it's not like making your first movie is, is a decision based in intelligence. (laughs) Oh God, no. (laughs) It's, uh, It's like, you just have to decide are you doing it or are you not doing it? Like, do you want it? Because if you want it, then throw the steering wheel out the window and you're going to win the game of chicken or you will crash and burn. <laughs> but, that's but, it, great. But, it, but at least there's not indecisiveness that's going to shoot you in your own foot and you'll be able to um, really move forward steadily with, uh, with the objectives that like, hey, I'm going to figure this out come hell or or high water, mm-hmm. and um, and I'm bringing people along with me who believe in the concept and what it is that we're all going to do together. And it's like we make our movie, right? Like it's not my movie. I mean, mm-hmm. like you know, I might be like, hey, check out my movie, this or that, but like it's our movie. It's like we're all doing it. So if if you get the right folks who are are happy to be on board and really are out to to do things at like a super duper high level, mm-hmm. um, then you're going to be great. And and also, you know, there's a lot of folks who. I work, you know, I, I shoot commercials, I do other things. I mean, there's there's people who are in the commercial world that, you know, they think of it as like making sausage, right? Like right. people want to people want to go make movies. People want to make indie movies. Like if they're if they're doing, you know, sausage making on sort of like a commercial level or web content that like doesn't pay money and you know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, I mean, it's not as fun. So it's like, why not? Um, empower people to do the things that they want to do anyway. Um, and you got to stick your neck out there a little bit, but I mean, you know, for me, it's like, it's a bigger failure if you don't try it. Um, and so it it wasn't, it wasn't too tough to kind of go make the decision. I think it was just more a question of like, well, how feasible is this? And you know, how long can it take? And of course it takes way longer than you think it's going to (laughs) take. Uh, it's way harder than you necessarily think it's going to be. Um, but hopefully at the end of it, you have something that you're really proud of. And, you know, in this case, that's, that, that does work out for me in terms of better off single and some of the other things that are going as well. So that's cool. So if, if I may be so bold as to suggest that if this whole directing thing doesn't work out, you write a book on analogies, <laughs> <laughs> sausage making the, the, the steering wheel yeah, I know. And, and the, and the bucket, those three are gems. Honestly, they're really great. I, I'm I'm not short of analogies. I'm sure I have more. <laughs> I'm telling you, right? You should write a book on filmmaking analogies. Just write a a quick ebook or something. It'd yeah, be great. great. <laughs> now, out of curiosity, what um what camera did you shoot on? You said Panavision. Did you shoot this on film? We shot on an Alexa. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. No, it was great. Our DP is a guy named Igor Kropotov, and uh, he did a really nice job, I think. And it looks gorgeous from the trailer. It looked gorgeous. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, it it was it was pretty fast, um, but I think it was nice having access to an Alexa because of the range that camera's got and mm, it's a gorgeous camera. You know, you can you can do a lot of stuff on that. So that's and, that's nice. And what size crew did you have, generally speaking? I mean, you know, it, it pretty standard kind of indie size crew. You know, like thirty five to fifty bodies kind of running around on any given day, depending on what was going on. Um, mm-hmm. You know. Uh, it was it was you know pretty legit. I mean, we we shot mostly uh, three and three as far as like our G and A team, and mm-hmm. um, you know we we had certain people came in extra depending on how big of a shoot day it was, and mm-hmm. we were at a bigger location, and maybe we want to try to use a jib. Um, but you know we were trying to be smart uh, and judicious about when we were going to get fancy with stuff. Mm-hmm. So like you know we we did have a day where we wanted to like you know get some like 
top down shots and have the camera fly through the air a little bit. So mm-hmm. it's like, okay, good. Well, what else can we piggyback on that day? Mm-hmm. And how can we maximize that? And where do we want it to be placed in the movie? And, you know, kind of go from there. I mean, I think Robert Rodriguez's book, um, is, yeah. is pretty informative in that sense. You know, he's like, look, I'm going to, I'm going to try to put high production value things at the beginning of my movie and at the end of my movie. And in the middle, um, we'll, we'll get by on story. <laughs> <laughs> So if we can if we can sort of tee it up that way and set the right tone, I mean, people are always interested to watch indie movies, but I think they're pleasantly surprised if they start watching an indie movie and it doesn't look terrible. And they're like, oh, that, oh this looks like a movie movie. It's not like an indie movie, you know? Um, right, right. It's colloquial approaches to this kind of thing. I mean, people who work in the film industry think about it differently, obviously, but like I just mean average moviegoers. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so for me, it's kind of like I want to set the tone like, yeah – did we do this pretty inexpensively? Was it difficult? You know, all the rest of the kind of stuff, the usual indie hustle stuff as you talk about. Um, yeah, but, uh, but we want it to look really good because ultimately that's going to be the thing that's going to enable us to pay our investors back and, um, and ensure we get as many eyeballs on it as possible, which is, which is really the point. Now, uh, and I'm assuming that your casting director had a lot to do with the great cast that you have? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think I think it certainly adds credibility um, when Patricia Deserto is picking up the phone um, because she's like literally a legend. I mean, she's amazing, mm-hmm. um, and and that definitely helps. Um, but but I also think it's kind of like, well, once you start to go down the path and you figure out, okay, well, this is how we're going to do it, then. Uh, you have to have the script that is going to work, and then you got to meet with people and you know make sure that that there's the right connection, you know, like that that it's going to work and that people understand the characters and that we're all sort of doing this for the right reasons. And so you can't have leads to your to your movie who show up on set and are like annoyed that they're going to change their clothes behind two V flats in the corner, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, right. you've got you've got to be like, okay, guys, like, so this is what we're going to do here, and you know, we need people to self report to set and you know there's nothing fancy going on here at all <laughs> like uh and it's not and that so, kind of movie <laughs> not that kind of movie and um you know and i've i've certainly been in situations where people don't seem to get that and it makes it a lot harder for everybody um and so this was a question of like all right well let's start building building the team and once we can get a few people on board of note then that's going to really help and we'll just sort of move from there and um, yeah, it was just kind of a really nice thing. I mean, I, it, it worked out great too. I think from the from the actors' perspective, because all of the actors in the movie um, are are great. You know, like they're tremendous, and um, and it became almost not really competitive exactly, but it's sort of like if you're an actor and you show up on this set and you don't have it that day, mm-hmm. you're gonna feel real silly. <laughs> right. <laughs> because everybody everybody brings it every day. You know, and that's that's one of the things that was awesome um, for me. Uh, directing a movie like this because because like literally like Aaron Tveit and Abby Elliott and Lauren Miller Rogan and Cal Penn and Lewis Black, mm-hmm. Chris Elliott and you know, Kellen Coleman and Shane McRae and like the whole you know the whole bunch of folks who, um, would come in and do this. I mean like Annalee Ashford is in the movie. She shot two days, um, and she flew in from L.A. Mm-hmm. on um, she was shooting Masters of Sex and she she flew in on a red eye on a Friday night and um, landed on Saturday morning, Mm -hmm. came to the production office, slept under a desk for like three hours. Wow. And then got up and then did this awesome scene. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And, and then went to sleep for like a normal night. And then we shot her out as fast as we could early in the morning. We were actually shooting at uh, Old Town Tavern in New York in a bar like, you know, at 7 a.m. Mm-hmm. And um, and then went to an apartment and shot her scenes and her coverage first. And then she headed back to the airport and flew back to L.A. so she could be back on set on Monday. And like those were her two days, you know. And, and it's like you get somebody like that who comes in and is like super happy to be there and does an amazing job. And it's like, great. That's like super invigorating for the first two days of our shoot to have someone like her there um, because it really sets the tone for the other people who come in and, and like, oh, we have somebody else who's going to be here for a day or for two days. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it's like, you know, the crew and everyone has a, an expectation around like sort of how this works and all the talent is on board and, you know, it's nice. 
Now, let me, do you have any advice uh, for dealing with agents when you're trying to hire top end talent? Advice for dealing with agents? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> it, <laughs> I, I think I think you just have to have your shit together because um, mm-hmm. agents, you know, they're not fucking around. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. You know, they, they're trying to do the best things that they can for their, for their clients and they care about their clients. Um, maybe they care about you, maybe they don't. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, it's like, unless you're showing them how it's going to be beneficial to their client, then you're kind of wasting their time and probably your own because it's not going to get it there. So, you know, look at your script. Do you have typos all over your script? Do you have verbiage and, you know, do you have descriptives that are like paragraph after paragraph in between actual Mm -hmm. dialogue? I mean, if you're Tarantino, you can do that. His scripts are littered with (laughs) descriptives, but he's Tarantino, so that's fine. Um, You know, for me, it's like get your syntax in order. um, Make sure that you sort of know what the expected types of things are, and before you send hit the send button on a script somewhere, make sure that it's full on ready and you're going to get your one read. So um, don't waste it. Uh, Take the extra time, really focus on the script, do it, and then just be no bullshit about it. Like, hey, this is what I can do. This is what I can't do. You know, this is what we can pay. This is what we can't pay. Um, I'd love to cast a person, but they have to work local. I'd love to do this, but they have to, you know, whatever, whatever the things are. Um, and I think agents will respect that and see that you're out to do stuff and then just don't make stuff up. If you say you're going to do something, do it. Uh, cause it sucks to have to re retrade. <laughs> right. Exactly. And then it also starts tarnishing your reputation with that agency. Yeah. I mean, I look at it as like, it's the Ben Cox brand, you know, that's all I have. So, uh, whatever that brand is worth, it, it'll be worth less if I'm totally full of shit. Um, but if I, if I say, look, these are the things I'm going to do, even if it ends up taking a little bit longer, but you kind of get there. Mm-hmm. Okay. But like, you know, you're not, you're not going into it and saying, here's my $800 million movie. Uh, let's cast for this. That's sort of a waste of time. But if you come in and you're like, look, this is a feasible way that we can go about getting this done. We'd like to attach, you know, your actors, because we think it'll help us with the remaining funds. You know, you don't go in saying something silly, like we have all the money when you don't or something like that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then, and then just don't waste people's time. You don't need to call every, every week, even, you know, just, just call when it's, when there's something relevant. Um, and then I think, I think you have a better chance. I'm not sure if that's much by way of advice, but <laughs> uh, no, it's a good, it's, it's, it's definitely good. Ad- it is good advice. It is good advice. Cause uh, you know, it sounds, it sounds rudimentary. Like it's like, Oh, you know, just, be honest, say what you're going to do. But sometimes you got to, you know, filmmakers need to hear that, you know, because a lot of times they want to try to impress or they're like, yeah, yeah, we've got the money in the bank. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> and if, yeah. you get, if you get caught with that lie, it's it's over. Yeah, well, be, be, be prepared to show bank statements, you know, like mm-hmm. if you need to show a bank statement, show a bank statement, you know, it's pretty straightforward. And if you can't show a bank statement, then there's a reason for that, right? Exactly. So, you know, it's uh you know, be prepared for people to call you on anything. But what's interesting is like, you know, like I produced a movie that we shot um, uh, this past fall. We just locked picture on. We're sending off to festival soon. And what was great is like, you know, that that was a movie that I got the benefit of having done better off single um, with all these agents and with these agencies. They're like, oh, right, you like we know who you are. I mean, I, yeah. you know, still you're an indie filmmaker. Um, it's not like they're going to give you the same level of importance as they will James you know, Cameron, <laughs> James Cameron, as an example. Um, but but they're like, okay, great, yeah, that's right. You employed uh, my actors, and um, they had a great experience, and they got paid, and they're really happy with their performances, and it looks good for their reel. Uh, sure, tell us about your next project. You know, like you'll get that benefit on a go forward basis. Um, you know, I, I think it's. I think it's it's refreshing in that sense, um, but but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of resistance, and and I get it. I mean, there's a lot of people who kind of say they're going to do something, and then they don't. And, you know, we're all kind of dealing with that, right? It's tricky. Yeah. Oh, oh God. Which brings me to my next question: financing, because God knows, <laughs> financing is always like, yeah, yeah, the money's in the bank. I I know this billionaire. He just wants to be in movies. How much do you need? Two hundred thousand. Oh, that's nothing. That's his coffee. But let me just you know, I, I've heard. I'm assuming you've heard that story a few times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So how did you get uh, the financing? If, if you don't mind me asking, like, how did you finance this this uh, this beast? 
I mean, about a million different conversations. With, <laughs> um, I mean, I, I mean that might be an exaggeration. It but might it's be true. Hundred thousand uh, conversations. I don't know. Uh, as a lot. Um, you know, look, I, I think uh, uh, for me, it was really just a question of uh, trying to let people know, like, this is what we're doing, and you keep going back and back and back and uh, trying to improve upon all of the investing materials that you pulled together, or try to improve upon the script, try to improve upon the team, try to improve upon what actors are attached. Like, do everything you possibly can and just keep doing it and doing it and doing it, and then eventually people will write checks and you kind of do what you need to do. Um, you know, we – we structured, we created a capital structure that deployed development funds. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, obviously, it, you know, they're on the riskier side, but you get a little bit better of a bump on your position when you roll it into the actual making of the film once you start shooting. So that's nice. But it gives you a little bit of leeway to um, make budgets and fly to LA when you need to, or, you know, just to meet people, like that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. and um, just kind of get you uh, to a certain point. And then, you know, straight equity uh, and then debt lending against the New York State production rebate. And I mean, getting a 30 percent below the line credit for everything you're doing in the state of New York is Mm -hmm. great. Uh, It's nice. So so why not try to utilize it if you can? Um, um, And then and then, of course, like, you know, trying to get deferrals from people and, you know, whatever you can in order to just like literally reduce the amount of cash you have to lay out out of the gate, because I'd rather give people back end. Um, when I don't have the funds, then, then not, um, mm-hmm. you know, as I, as I evolve in my career, assuming there's an evolution taking place, uh, I, you know, then I, then I think the back end becomes more precious because, uh, because that's where, you know, it, you really make money. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, in theory, <laughs> but in theory, yeah. But when you don't have, but we don't have the money to shoot at all, then the back end is worth zero because there is nothing. Right. Um, so I'd rather I'd rather give away um, back end and um, uh, and shoot a movie and make a movie than have no movie to show for it at all. So I think it's just trying to get creative with the capital structure, and then you know going out and doing the best that you possibly can. And, and also, look, this is one of those ones where, for me, I'm like, listen, I'm producing, directing, and I'm writing this movie, and I'm going to get paid as a deferral for all that stuff. So, you know, I will put my money where my mouth is with this. And if I don't believe that you can get paid back your equity plus some form of preferred return mm-hmm. before I get paid to produce, write, and direct this movie, mm-hmm. and, you know, I, I think it makes it a little bit easier of a conversation to just be like, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is and, um, it is right. Kind of from there. Right. Like, yeah. Exactly. If you're if you're if you're getting a paycheck and then you're expecting everybody else not to get a paycheck and work on deferred, it's a tougher sell than if you're like, look, I'm I'm in the same boat you guys are. Yeah, and I think that works both for crews and for actors as well as for investors because everybody <laughs> is going to be taking some form of a, a capital risk one way or the other. Um, either it's opportunity cost with their time or it's actually writing a check, and so. You know, I think you, I think you just got to approach it the right way. And you know, if you're asking yourself, well, what more can I do today to make this movie happen? Um, that's a pretty obvious one. So, I think on your first one, there's there's certainly no shame in it. And then once you sort of get past that point, then it's like, all right, look, I did that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know if I can afford to keep doing that anymore. You know, I've got two kids. You know, blah blah blah. <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> and, and, well, you know, and then also you're kind of like, now I have that track record, and I and I actually do know what I'm doing. <laughs> so, right. It's not just theoretical anymore. It's like it's like, yeah, I can do this. <laughs> yeah, I could. Yeah, it's yeah, exactly. You're you're now a feature director. You're not just a commercial director or a short film director. You're now officially a feature director. It's under one's under your belt. So now they can't say that you can't do one. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so that's so and um, how did you get distribution for this film? Uh, and I know you are. Being distributed by friends Gravit- of, friends of the show, Gravitas. Yeah, yeah, no, they're great. Um, we um, we hired a company called Circus Road Films to. Uh, I know, sir. I know Sebastian very well. Yeah, right. Exactly, Sebastian and Glenn, and um, and and like literally, they just said, okay, so this is what we think in terms of like a plan, and uh, we want to do things sort of all around uh, a festival um, and making sure we get things sort of going the right way. And then we hired a PR company called Prodigy mm-hmm. to um, to do a bunch of press for us around our premiere at the Santa Barbara International Film Festival. Um, how was that, how was that premiere, by the way? How is how is the festival? Did they treat, is it a good, good – I heard it was a really good fest. 
Yeah, I really, I really like it a lot. Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd been a whole bunch of times to like Sundance and mm-hmm. in Iran on Tribeca and like a bunch of different places, and I had never been to, to the Santa Barbara Festival. And then someone mentioned to me, um, you know, you guys should sort of check these these folks out and like literally I was looking into it and then they called us and they were like, Hey, we heard about your movie. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And I was like, really? (laughs) (laughs) Well, (laughs) okay, cool. Um, and, and they wouldn't really divulge it, uh, how they heard about it or whatever. Sure. Of course. Um, uh, but presumably from us submitting somewhere else and maybe somebody said something good like, hey, we can't program the, the, the movie, but maybe you should, right? you should take a look at it. Um, and so they took a look at it and they said, we, we'd love to program it. And then so we talked to, you know, I talked to Aaron Tveit and Abby Elliott and Kellen Coleman and Lauren Miller Rogan and um, just tried to figure out, well, who's going to be in L.A. then and who can come out for this and help us with the PR. And so, you know, folks came out for the premiere, which was great. And, you know, we, we had uh, two sellouts for the movie. And then the festival was like, hey, you sold it out twice. We'll, just, we'll give you a third screening. So we're like, great. So then we, um, you know, played the movie again, which was cool. Um, and I think because of the nice press around that and the positioning that, like, Circus Road had been doing with, you know, the various distributors, um, it helped. And then also Aaron Tveit just prior to that was, you know, he played Danny Zuko on Grease Live. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, like his IMDb star meter the week of our premiere at Santa Barbara was one. And so we're, <laughs> we're like, all right, that's good. We like that. Um, and so we actually had a number of uh, companies that were pretty aggressively pursuing us to distribute the movie, um, which was great. And, um, you know, I think I think I couldn't have asked for a better festival experience in terms of like just the way the festival was, and I would definitely recommend the festival to anyone. I mean, it's it's that's nice. They know what they're doing over there, um, and you know they're giving awards to a lot of uh, celebrities as well, uh, Oscar contenders and things like that, leading up to the Academy Awards, and uh, and I think that helps also just in general getting members of press up there and kind of doing stuff. I mean, like Leonard Malton of all people, mm-hmm. and to be at the premiere of a better off single. And I'm, I'm like, awesome. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's just one of those kind of interesting things that that's just what happens in Santa Barbara. And so that was nice. And I think it definitely helped. Now, uh, the last two questions I ask, I ask all of my guests, uh, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in life or in the film business? <laughs> that's wow. my, op- it's my Oprah question. If you were a tree, what kind of number? <laughs> That is an Oprah question. Uh, I, I'm definitely an Oprah fan. Uh, you know, l- large lesson. Boy, I don't know. I feel like I'm, I wonder how deep I should get with that. Um, is, I've, I've had people go extremely deep. So as, as deep as you feel comfortable with, sir. Yeah. I mean, you know, look, I, I think, I think like it's tricky. It's tricky. Um, I think there's a balance between the notion of some of the things that we talked earlier about earlier, like, you know, taking the steering wheel and throwing it out the window and um, really trying to, like, move forward with, like, making a project and getting it done. And then also, like, your personal life. Um, because in order to get a movie like like this made, you're doing crazy things, like you're editing through the night, you're, you know, whatever. There's, like, lots of stuff that happens to make a movie like this. But I do think there is a balance between sort of how that goes and then how much strain you can put on, like your personal relationships like with your wife or with your kids or like whatever <laughs> i mean there, there's only so far you can take it i mean i think i think trying to find the right balance for like how obsessed you want to become with the making of the movie versus like your uh, life yeah ensuring that you have other things going on uh that are sort of outside that whole thing which in part for me is why i love living in new york because People don't really care if you make movies, you know, like if you're in L.A., it's like everybody's talking about movies and TV and that's great. But like it's hard for somebody like me because I'm I'm kind of obsessed. So Mm -hmm. uh, so so trying to figure out where that obsession should um, end (laughs) is a pretty important lesson um, and probably one that, you know, it's taken me a little while to learn. I'm not sure if I fully learned it and you'd have to ask my wife, but the uh, but nonetheless, I think it's uh, I think it's important. And then what are the three of your favorite films of all time? Three of my favorite films of all time. I mean, 
I think I think Casablanca might be mm-hmm. my my favorite of all time. I think uh, not only from like a screenwriting um, perspective and just how quotable that movie is. I mean, it's it's, it's incredible uh, how many of the lines from that film permeate the <laughs> the culture. The American the zeitgeist. Yeah. Even now, I mean, it's uh, it's it's remarkable in that sense. But I also think like Curtis just did like an incredible job from a directing perspective in terms of like where the camera is. Um, you know, what do you have in the foreground? What do you have in the background? What are you doing um, to really suck people in? And I think I think it also has one of the most compelling and um, important scenes in cinematic history with that whole sort of uh, battle between the the German national anthem and, and the French national anthem. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, it was a great scene. Oh, you know, I think, I think that, that scene and that sequence is, is hugely important and just sort of globally important um, at the time as well. And, you know, that's, that's definitely sort of right up there for me in terms of uh, one of the, one of the films that uh, really works for me. Um, I think a movie like Annie Hall is, mm. um, you read my mind too. I was thinking of that movie. Oh uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's tremendous. I mean, uh, on, on so many levels and, um, you know, I think, I think it's just fascinating. I think there's a lot of like things you can learn from a movie like that. I mean, you know, there's sort of like the, you know, like the save the cat, uh, mm-hmm. that screenwriting book and the concept of like the Pope in the pool, right? Like mm-hmm. you, um, you, you need to get exposition out, but you don't want to bore people. So you have to come up with a Pope, in the pool swimming laps in the background of like the, the exposition, uh, just to distract people and make sure that they feel entertaining. You watch something like Annie Hall and it's like, you know, he's driving his car or she, Annie's driving him home from, from meeting at the, the tennis, um, match or whatever. And she's like almost getting into a car accident and he finds like a half eaten sandwich in the car. And like, you know, there's like these comedic moments, but the entire time she's talking about her Grammy and Chippewa falls and setting up stuff later. Mm -hmm. And, and there's just so much depth and so many layers to just like, not just like Pope in the pool type stuff, but like all of the things that he does and getting really personal and letting scenes play and just being epically creative. Um, which, uh, which I think, is super duper powerful and, and uh, really kind of fascinating. Um, and then I, and then I, you know, I don't know. I'd say anything that like Kubrick does. Like I, j- I just think that like, the amount of um, detail in any Stanley Kubrick movie is uh, mm-hmm. is, is sort of uh, mind boggling. Um, and you know, I can see like, all right, well, I don't know if I need to do like you know, eighty nine takes of, of a particular <laughs> scene uh, necessarily. I mean, uh, but but like when things work. It, it's it's kind of it's kind of great. I mean, like the duel scene in Barry Lyndon is That's one of my brilliant. favorites of all time, and and it's just, it's played so slow, but like I don't see how the comedy could be any better. I mean, it's genius, <laughs> and, and like I, I just I just think from like a craft perspective, um, the stuff that he he does in his pictures um, that he did, um, it really just sort of takes it to another level, and so it kind of gives us all something that we can aspire toward. Uh, so where can people find you online? Uh, well, so my company is Red Square Pictures. If you go to redsquarepictures.com, um, you can find links to a bunch of different things there. Um, you know, it's on Facebook and Twitter and all that kind of stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. Better Single is out October 7th. Um, so there's various um, clips and you know, trailers and stuff like that still uh, going to be released in the coming days leading up to the October 7th. Um, release of the movie so and that'll be up on itunes and theaters and select cities and different places there so you can find better off single in a whole bunch of places and but yeah i think redsquarepictures.com is a good place to start and facebook and twitter of course thank you man thanks for being on the show and uh, dropping some knowledge bombs on the the, the tribe man i appreciate it <laughs> thank you so much for having me really really a pleasure hope you guys in- enjoyed my interview with benjamin cox um and i'm so happy that you got that movie made uh, it looks funny as all hell. You'll be able to see the trailer uh, and links to where it's available in the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 110 or 110. So, guys, thanks again as always. And don't forget to head over to IndieFilmSyndicate.com and check out the over 300 tutorial online videos uh, and, and courses that we have uh, for filmmakers and this very thriving film community where we're actually now 
uh, doing uh, portfolio reviews of people uh, submitting uh, commercials, uh, short films, uh, trailers, and uh, I kind of just review it with them uh, live. And I post it up on the Facebook group and in the syndicate so everybody can learn from it and we could all kind of grow as uh, filmmakers together. So it's a really fun community, guys. I really wish uh, I wanted to make it bigger uh, and get it as big as humanly possible. Uh, There's a lot of value there. So IndieFilmSyndicate.com. And if you want that 25% off coupon, it's still available. Head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 25 off, the number 25 and off. And don't forget to head over to filmmakingpodcast.com and leave me a good review, guys. It really helps the show out a lot. So thank you again so much. And as always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I will talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 